from the North Beach Podcast Company in partnership with GSM. We welcome you to episode 16 of season two of the Ray and Greg's Hockey Podcast. Uh, always an interesting week, Ray, and I, I don't know if you're feeling the same thing. I mean, look, we're not in the building, so we don't get the intensity of the game other than watching either in studio or in our uh, home studios. But man, in the last 10 days, maybe even in the last week, the intensity of these games has amped up considerably. And that makes perfect sense from the second half of the shortened regular season. But can you see it? Can you feel it? <laughs> you see yeah. The game but also, that? Drake's, I, and I didn't understand this, I don't think, until I was in the bubble for the World Junior Tournament, where, you know, we were in a legit bubble for three weeks. Yeah. But you start to get agitated a little bit because nothing's normal and you feel cramped in and locked in. And it's really, um, it was really an odd odd feeling. And so I think as the players are starting to play games, they, it seems like the games are climbing over top of each other. There's so many games they have to play. They travel, they go to a hotel, they can't go anywhere. They can't visit with anybody. They just kind of sit there mm -hmm. and then they play. And I, I think the pressure of the games, their, your position in the standings and the agitation starts to build into what have become pretty intense games. And, and I, th I, I mean, pretty clearly it's going to get that way as we as we slide along here towards the end of the year. No question. We've got a good collection of uh, headlines, which we'll get to in, in just a moment. Also, an interview with San Jose Sharks forward Curtis Gabriel, an outspoken leader uh, in the fight for diversity and LGBTQ inclusivity in the National Hockey League, generally across society. What a thoughtful young man uh, coming up later in the podcast. However, um, I've had a couple of tweets at me wondering how Cammy's birthday went because it was a, it was like a two-day event right it was yes, it wasn't it was. just a one-off it was a it was a two-day event did it come off flawlessly uh well she turned 50 and <laughs> things you know we had a nice dinner so yeah I would say so I mean she was happy she uh it was a really cool thing had a bunch of uh her teammates and uh, uh send videos and uh about 40 or 50 people send some wishes as well um and uh, it, I, I think, I, quite frankly, I think that's what she liked best was just to yeah, see man. all her family and and uh, friends. And they said some really, really nice things about her. And um, so, yeah, it went, it, it went well. I'm, and uh, yeah, I, I think so. I mean, you know, she she seemed happy, and yeah, that's the that's the whole point, isn't it? Yeah. Well, and now you're off the hook, right? I mean, when's the next milestone birthday? I don't feel like. 55 doesn't cut it. Like doesn't 55 cut 55 is like a retirement target, and it's unrealistic for most of us. Um, but I don't know. 50 is a bit, 40 was a big one. Yeah. 50 is a big one. After that, they all just kind of, you hope for the next one, right? I think, I, yeah, well, I think you do something at 60. I, I'm with you. I, you know, I don't think 55 is a, a retirement age because I'm 57, and so well, that's <laughs> that's not the case. So uh, yeah, I think 60. Which, geez, 10 years from now, whew. she's it's already long plotting. Way. She's got three years to work on your 60th. It's going to be a well, soiree. Well, hopefully, Dregs, by that time we're out of the house. Well, you think so? Well, I hope. I hope we're moving along quicker. We're going backwards <laughs> in British Columbia now. So we're now, you know. Rightfully so. Restaurants are closed. Gyms are yeah. closed. You know, public gatherings are closed. And so like at a time when we were all hoping we would be going north, we're kind yeah. of going south here again. Not to derail the podcast with uh, political rantings here, COVID-19 related, but I, I don't even know what the hell we're doing in Ontario, to be fair. I mean, every morning I at about 10, 15, Christine Elliott, who's the Minister of Health, releases our numbers. And the last 10 days, two weeks, our numbers have been 2,000 or more every single day. But yet, you know, I mean, things are open for the most part. You know, it's, you know, as we're recording uh, episode 16 here on Tuesday, I mean, the weather is calling for 17 degrees Celsius. So the patios are going to be open. There's going to be people. Okay, but so why can't, why can't governments do this and say, look, I know we've been through a year of this, but yeah. it's March the 30th. Here are our five guidelines for March the 30th. And that's it. If you simplify it, people have a chance to follow it. Yeah. If you have 74 rules that keep changing and nobody can follow, then how can you follow what you don't understand? Yeah. I, 
I'm a big believer in simplicity um, and make it possible so people can understand because I'm with you. I don't know what the hell we're doing. I, I feel like George Costanza's dad. What the hell are we doing here? Yeah. Well, I, I look at, I feel for you, uh, Cammie, and, and all the parents with kids in school, you know, here in Ontario, they're battling over, well, do we have spring break? Do we delay it? It's, you know, and, you know, again, these kids need a break um, because it's yes. been mentally stressful. It really, truly has. You know that. Um, the parents most definitely need a break. The teachers need yeah. a break from, from all of this, yet Premier Ford in Ontario just basically says, I, I don't know. I, ask me in three days. Maybe I'll know then. Well, you, you know, I know it becomes part of the kids' lives, like wearing a mask and stuff. But yeah. I'll tell you, I find it kind of sad when I drop the boys off at school and they put their masks on. I, I find it sad for them. Yeah. And yeah. so the teachers are in there every day and they got to prep the lessons and mark the lessons. And they need they need to mentally get away from the place. Just 100%. Just let them relax, take a breath. Nobody can go anywhere. Nobody's going on vacation. No. They just need a break. 100% agree. Um, bad segue. Speaking of breaks, Aaron Eckblad of the Florida Panthers uh, having such a wonderful year. Definitely, you know, it's, it's one of these strange, well, not one of, it's an incredibly unique and strange world, strange year. The voting is going to be different this year for the major award winners, rightfully so, um, because of the division changes and, and lots of reasons behind that. He would have been in my conversation with the Norris Trophy, right, just based on the year that he's had. He goes down in a heap in, in one of those just bizarrely unfair accidents. I think that's a, a fair way to describe it. As if not, his, his leg crumples you know, underneath him as his weight takes him down going backwards, he's skating backwards. And we learned yesterday from the Florida Panthers that he requires surgery. Um, he, you know, it's a fractured leg, so he's going to be out the rest of the season. Who's kidding who? It'll be, they said 12 yeah. weeks. It'll be the rest of the year. I mean, what do you make of a situation like that beyond it being just seemingly so unfair? Well, I am, um, I, I will say I was kind of um, when I heard that it was a fractured leg and not understanding any of the other complications around it. Um, I was kind of happy that it, for him, that it was not his knee. Like the bone will heal. They'll, I had, a, I fractured my leg and dislocated my ankle. And the hard part is anything that moves the ankle joint. Yeah. That was the hard part. The bone heals. The bone mm -hmm. heals whenever it's going to heal. And for Aaron, it's going to be the rest of the year. Um, he would have been in my conversation too. I mean, I've got Victor Hedman lap in the field right now. But um, Ekblad is, plays 25 minutes a night. He's had an excellent year for a team that is, you know, they got, they got what do they got, 48 points as of today, two yeah. points behind Tampa. He was a vital cog of that team. And I'm looking at Florida's defense drags, and I'm thinking, you know what? They they got seven guys, but they're kind of guys, you know, like yeah. nobody's going to play 25 minutes for them. And you can say, oh, we'll do it by committee, but they might have to explore if there's a rental out there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> because he's a he's their matchup guy. He's their top pair guy. He's kind of does everything for them. And, it, and it's hard to ask somebody else. Oh, yeah. Why don't you just go fill this role? Yeah. Tough role to fill. And and. In Florida's case, I'm just kind of leafing through my notes here. I had a conversation with a good source yesterday, Ray. Who, well, it uh, would be a better source if you could find it. I, I found it. I found it. Okay. He listed off a series of uh, potential defensemen available, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, some of these names you would have heard, obviously, uh, in play. Uh, Savard from the Columbus Blue Jackets, Goligoski, um, Eh, Oliver Ekman Larson. I don't think not we on that road. That's not happening between now and the trade deadline. Um, hey, some interesting ones potentially, and let's say potentially out of <clears throat> Anaheim, uh, Manson, Fowler. You're not getting both those guys out of there. Be one of them, I presume. Um, Calvin DeHaan, Chicago, Zadaroff, maybe. You know, so yeah. I mean. 
it's just whether you want to spend the assets or what it's going to take to get those players, right? Right. And and don't forget, and I think this is pretty critical going into the deadline, not just in, in Florida, but everywhere. Is, so you make a trade, that might lump you into a protection problem for yeah. Seattle in just a few short months. And so the the rental guys, I think their prices are going to go up because the good teams are going to, if they want to add a player, yeah, they they might have to pay a premium for a rental. You're 100 percent right. And I, I'm actually going to touch on this on insider trading. You know, Ronnie Francis. I mean, we love Ronnie Francis. <laughs> he's yeah. a, he's an interesting guy, but he goes about his business sleuth like. Like he's just you know under the radar. Doesn't want to be in the media. Doesn't want to do any of that stuff. Yeah. But exactly what you said is what's happening already. And we shouldn't be surprised by that. But, you know, let's say, you know, let's assume, and we're going to talk about Nashville coming up here, but Matias Ekholm, all right, we reported last week that three pieces are required. So you want a first round pick, you want an elite level prospect, whatever that is, uh, and you want a third element to it, right? Well, all of a sudden you're that team that's giving those three pieces. It isn't actually three pieces. It's probably more like four or maybe even more because maybe one of the pieces that you've had to include in this trade was a piece that you felt more comfortable exposing, right? So Francis might be drawn to that piece. Well, now he's looking at another piece that you don't want to lose. So you've got to give him something not to take that guy. I mean, but which is, right which is really what uh, Vegas did exceptionally yeah. well. And they, so they parlayed it into draft choices and extra players. Um, it's going to be really interesting. The one, uh, I would say the one handicap the, the crack can have is that everybody just watched Vegas do this. Yeah. So I felt that George McPhee and Kelly McCrimmon gamed the system. They knew the system better than the other general managers. And by the time it was, by the time it was over, some teams were looking for their shoes because <laughs> Kelly and George had them too. Well, I, I got to talk to Ronnie at some point, but, you know, McCrimmon and George split the league, right? Yeah. 15 and 15. You watch these 15, I'll watch these 15. We'll compare notes all the way through. Then towards the end, we'll, we'll do some crossover work and we'll make sure we've got it covered. And I assume that the, the Kraken are doing the same. You could probably expand on that, but I'm not sure that wouldn't get you in trouble. I will say this, and I'm not even kidding. I walk into Cammie's office and she closes her computer. I, I'd like to look over her shoulder. I've tried and I can't get there. So when you talk about the Ron Francis sleuth like stuff, yeah, yeah. I think it's I think it's permeated. I think it's everywhere. You know who else is like that? Is Ricky Olchek, who's Ron's Ron's <laughs> assistant general manager. Yeah. Ricky's a lawyer. Yeah. yeah. Um, Eddie Olchek's brother. And you try to talk to Ricky about a player. Pretty soon you're talking about the weather. You don't even know how wh where you started. And and Ricky's giving you Zippo, nothing. Nothing. And he talks so fast, right? Oh. And he's so positive. <laughs> hey, Driggs, how's it going? Everything good there, man? We're watching. The teams are great. <laughs> Hockey's great. That Canadian division. What about that North division? Hey, you're pretty solid. It's <laughs> <laughs> a million miles an hour. <laughs> he's awesome. Uh, mention Matias at home. Uh, yep. If you're David Poyle, um, are you believing what you're seeing? And what we're seeing now is five straight wins uh, as of last night, again, taping here on Tuesday. Um, and, and in a playoff position right now, which would encourage you to not move Matias Ekholm or Mikhail Granlund or another piece. Or now he's going to wait, right? He's going to wait until, you know, there's a bunch of games that Nashville will play between now and right. April 12th. So that's going to be the window of his barometer. But do you turn from being a seller to potentially being a buyer if you believe in what you see? Well, a factor here is in four of those five wins, Dregs, Roman Yossi's back in the lineup. Yeah. So you say, wait a minute. We were no good. Yeah. We put our best player back in the lineup, and now we're good. So I, I guess I mentioned that only in that if you had your – your team together and they, and they started to play better. You know, they won five straight. I don't think I'd, I, I think I'd be a little hesitant what I, to believe it. 
I would like, how do I know it wasn't my real team isn't the early team or this team I'm seeing now? I'm more liable to believe what I'm seeing now because I've added a player that's supposed to be there. Right. And he's a 25 minute guy. So, but you're, you're going to get into a problem and maybe that's a problem for the end of the year. We just talked about Seattle, but they're going to run into a protection problem on the blue line in Nashville. Again, it seems like for a hundred years, Nashville's had really great defensemen, but they're going to run into it again. Um, Ekholm, Yossi, Ellis, Fabro. Fabro, yeah. So do you go four and four? Well, you've got no trades in there somewhere. They've got, I don't know the contract, uh, no trades of Johansson and, and Duchesne, but if there are no trades, well, you might get boxed into something else. Yeah. Hey, man, he's he's going to be the one guy whose fortunes or rather whose ideas might have changed here recently. Right, right. Which might be bad news for some of the interested suitors. Although, again, as we talked about, based on the ask out of Nashville on a player like Matias Ekholm, there weren't there are lots of teams, GMs interested. Nobody that's willing to step up yet, being the operative mm-hmm. word. Um, we're on a theme of defense, and I know you want to talk about Kale McCarr. Uh, what a what a fun guy to watch, right? He is just something else when he gets going. His skating is incredible, yeah. and and I would say one of the biggest developments in in professional hockey is the way that the kids have trained over the last 10 or 12 years on their edges, weight distribution, hip pivots. And so we're seeing guys now, excuse me, that are in the NHL that have spent all this time where we never see them training in the rinks and working on things that players couldn't do before. Mm -hmm. There's been a couple of plays this year where Kale McCarr literally has in the basketball term broken somebody's ankles. Like he's gone one way, pivoted the other. This guy just collapses in the middle of the ice and McCarr goes in. The play he made yesterday, I think it was to Nachuskin. He went around the back of the net. He gets his feet wide open. And goes, oh my, he goes right around the net and then slides it right between the defense from <laughs> the goalie right to Nachuskin who shoots it in the net. Like amazing stuff. Colorado, I hope they stay healthy because man, I love watching them play. My, you just brought up a memory. My son used to train with Tracy Tutton, who works with a few NHL teams. She's a power skating coach, and she would. They're called Eagles, right? Where you you and so I'd be I had nothing better to do. He's out there in a one-on-one training session, and he's doing these things. And every single time, it was just like a knee-jerk response. I'd have my coffee, and then I'd I'd, I'd look down, and I'd be trying to bend my feet out. <laughs> How was that working? Well, I'm like, I, there's no way I'd have ever been able to do that. Maybe I guess at his age, he was probably 13, 14 years old. So you're pretty limber. <clears> you know, you know who, uh, you know, who was the first guy I ever saw do that in a game it was Ulf mm-hmm. Dahlin. Wow. And so we used to call him the old 10 to two and uh, he'd go down the boards and boop, he'd pop his feet two. open and you, and everybody would be like, what the hell is he doing? And then you'd try it and you go, I can't do that. Oh. It was really effective for to elude somebody. And now, now, ninety five percent of the league would do it. Maybe a hundred percent. They can all well, do it, whether they use it or not. Right. Well, yeah. It, to be able to do it in the game, just think of the skill. Yeah. Like Matt, I think right away of Matt Barzell and yeah. Connor McDavid doing it. Right. Yeah. And you know, we just talked about Makar. Quinn Hughes does it too. Yeah. It's, but you mentioned edge work. There were a couple of examples on Monday night. Um, wow. Well, we're going to talk to the Leafs in Edmonton now, but, you know, the, the Mitch Marner goal, right, where oh, he yeah. cuts across. Uh, <laughs> and we mentioned Nashville and their defense. You know, Dante Fabro maybe wasn't thinking that DeBrinket was coming in with the speed that he showed, but whoops, all of a sudden he's flat footed and the brinket cuts and the puck is in the net. So the, um, the Marner Marner's interesting because he can almost cut across the slot and go in a straight line with his yeah. feet pivoted wide open. Yeah. And when he does it, I, what I'm always impressed with is his heads up. He's looking around for the next play, but now he shoots it out of that spot. Yeah. Which like even Matthew's goal last night, 
were were unbelievable shot, but he comes around the back of the net. He opens up his feet and now he pivots and he's right in front of the net for in my day, that was two more strides. Like literally you had to chop around to get there. They do it so quickly. And you're, it must be a terrible feeling for a D (laughs) when you realize, uh Oh, I got the wrong gap and I got no speed. Yeah. Because the break it was, was going at the wrong speed for Fabro last night. Matthews is looking healthy again, isn't he? He is. Yeah. Yep, he looks healthy again. He uh, that that goal last night and a couple of shots he took. Um, lo- it looks everything looks back in sync yeah. for him, and he better get going because Ovi's coming like a freight train. <laughs> and and I find it interesting. You got McDavid, you got Matthews, and oh, here comes the old dog, and he's yeah. You know, I think he's got 11 goals in 11 games right now. He just, he can't, he never stops. He just never stops. It's fun to watch. Russian machine, never break. Isn't that his line? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Toronto Edmonton. Uh, So we've seen a a good sample size now of of this head-to-head matchup. And earlier in the year, I mean, Toronto played probably a three-game near flawless series, right? In Edmonton where they they beat the Oilers in every sense of the word. Uh, More pushback from Edmonton. You know, in in this set here in Toronto, um, and I, I mean, you can pick a, a team or you can analyze both teams if you choose. Are we at a place? Of course, they're they're top contending teams in their division, but when we're paying closer attention now to what's going on around the, the league, do we still see the holes in the lineup and, and maybe the maturity level of the group not being there yet to classify them as top contenders overall? Um, I, I think uh, Toronto's a little bit better than Edmonton. I think they're a little deeper. Uh, you get, you know, you get past the big boys in Edmonton and you kind of search. And on, and I think you can see that Dave Tippett searches too because he moves those bottom six forwards around a lot. Mm-hmm. He's got a Devin Shore in. He's got a Tyler Ennis in. Dominic Cahoon is in. Yeah. Um, you know, they've tried McDavid together with Dreisaitl. They've tried him apart. You know, they've got to find some balance to that. Um, but but I don't – I think Toronto's better set up to have uh, more depth through the top of that lineup. The the one wild card for me has been Mike Smith has been phenomenal. Really good. I mean, the, the Oilers circled back to Smith after they took a couple of bigger swings in free agency. And there are times when he looks like he stepped on a banana peel. But, man, he is big. He's athletic. He can, he fights like he oh. battles and he has given them top rate goaltending. And, and I, I think that's a, a plus for Edmonton so far that they probably didn't think they were going to have. And in Toronto, uh, is it fair to question the goaltending in, in Toronto purely because of the health, right? I mean, Jack Campbell is being managed now just to make sure that they maintain his good health we don't officially know what the heck is going on with, with Freddie Anderson, but it must be more than just a nagging muscle strain or something along those lines. So from a health perspective, there could be other reasons why you question Toronto's goaltending. Is that an area they need to look at? Uh, I, I, well, we don't have the information, right? So, But the, the most concerning part of that whole thing to me, obviously Anderson's not right. He hasn't skated. I think it's March 19th. He was last on the ice. The fact that you're managing Jack Campbell makes me a little queasy mm-hmm. because you, you're not full goal with him. It's not like, you know, he played, they give him a day off. He plays, he gets, you know, now he's missing a game here and they, they want to be careful with him. And I don't think they have a choice. The fact that they're being super careful with him tells me Anderson's not great. Right. And so if you think that you're a legit team, can you go into the playoffs with Campbell and Hutchinson? I'd say not, but that's not having any information on Freddie Anderson. Like is Anderson two more weeks? Is he a month? Is he, you know, like, unless you know that and they're not going to tell us um, that probably drives your decision. Yeah. And I mean, this isn't a criticism of Freddie. It's just reality. I remember going way back into his days in Anaheim where he was that player and I can appreciate this as a goaltender. I'm not, but as a goaltender, you need to feel healthy. Right. And, and, and when you don't feel healthy, then it starts to take both a physical and a mental toll. And that was always 
maybe even considered a weakness in Anaheim. I mean, he seemed to shed that in Toronto. So we'll have to await, as you say, more information before we figure out what they're going to do in that position. Final headline, Ray, goes to Patty Marlowe of the San Jose Sharks. Just played 1,757 games career. To move into second overall, behind Gordie Howe, of course, over uh, surpassing uh, Mark Messier for second spot on the all time games played list. Gordy Howe at 1,767. So now Marlowe, as we're recording this on Tuesday, is 10 games shy. And I'm not going to lie, as a fellow Saskatchewan proud prairie boy, it, it warms my heart that these two Saskatchewan guys have had that, that resiliency, you know, just to be able to play the game at a top level for so many years. But Patrick Marlowe going past Gordy bugs me. I'm happy that he's had a wonderful career in all those things. It's just, you know, it's like the Wayne Gretzky scoring records. I don't, I don't want anybody to touch those. I want him to get close. I just don't want him to pass. And, you know, it looks like Marlowe's going to pass Gordy. See, there, <clears throat> I want Ovi to challenge Gretzky because I think it'll be amazing yeah. for the game. The game's played record, even when Patrick passes him, I'll always have in my head that it's Gordy Howe. For and sure. that's and that's because of our age and how we we grew up. The the one thing that about games played that I realized when I played my thousandth game was that you have to be lucky enough to be healthy to play a thousand games, but you've got to be good enough to be asked to play a thousand games. Mm -hmm. Lots yeah. of guys would show up, but for a thousand <laughs> games, but they don't get the opportunity. And so to do it now, look, he's he's by far on the backside of his career here. He's got, you know, I think one goal in 30 games this year. But the fact is, he has been there night after night after night forever. It's a remarkable accomplishment. Mm -hmm. it, it, I mean, 1,757 games. It's, a, it's amazing. 1,194 really. points. So... What has he got? 22 games left. Um, here's hoping he gets six points. <laughs> hey, just get six points. Well, get to 1,200 and go right to the Hall of Fame. Yeah, so you're just saying the 1,200 is just a nice number. It's just a nice round number. Yeah. It would well, bug me if I were a player and I and and I my career finished six points shy of an even. Would it bug you? Would it bug you if you had 898 points? Yes, <laughs> that would bug me. It bugs me that the official scores didn't do their work. I got I got screwed out of a couple assists somewhere. I had to have. A hundred percent. Like, and all kidding aside. I'm sure I got a few gifts, though, I got to say. There had, so what you're saying then is, even though you probably got jobbed out of a couple of second assists here or there, it balances, right? Because maybe you got a soft one. It would, well, it would balance if I had 900 points. Okay. It didn't balance. I was, I, I, the system screwed me, Drakes. <laughs> oh, you should have went back for like, how many games would it have taken you? Uh, yeah, I mean, you've told this story. You knew you were done. Yeah. Uh, there, there were issues. Um, how many games? Like, you think you could have sealed it up in one game and then retired? Got the no, I, I, it might have taken me 10. <laughs> <laughs> Problem was, I didn't have anybody offering a 10 day contract. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll play and then I'll give the money back. It doesn't work. I just, out. I want the two points. Yeah. I just want them. And I think I'm going to, I think what I'm going to do is go back through some game film now that I'm uh, thinking of this and For see sure. if I can find, and maybe I could dig up a couple and I'm sure the league would love to hear <laughs> from me and say, Hey, I found an assist in 1997. Is there anything else about the numbers in your careers you look back that bug you? That's one of them, obviously. No, not nothing else. To, I mean, uh, it's kind of neat. I have just like a penalty minute a game. You know, yeah. I had a lot of penalty, you know, whatever. 400 goals. That's a good number. 898 is just yeah. not right. 898 doesn't sound as good as 900. Who's no chance. Be? So for people that don't really pay attention, I tell them I got 900 points. <laughs> <laughs> Damn near 900 points. <laughs> That's the one. Well, we always joke because Dave Poole says he has no idea how many empty net goals he scored. And I, I'm going to guess you probably weren't on the ice very often in that situation. Is that a two? 
<laughs> you know. Well, one, I came out of the penalty box. I was serving a penalty. <laughs> I was not. I was not an option with the empty net. <laughs> you were a defensive stalwart. I can't actually when you. when we had when we had a lead drags, I can say safely that's when I got to know the spare goalie best. <laughs> I was what not the conversations like were you were you analyzing what was happening while you were watching? Or depends where the puck was. You know, you're kind of in the game, you're talking along, you know, get it out, move it up, you know, yeah. cover it. Like you're not helping, you're just kind of talking. And sometimes the puck's at center ice and you're just talking. Right. About nothing. <laughs> <laughs> where are we going tonight? Oh, yeah. let's, get night off. let's get moving here. Come on. No <laughs> more whistles. No more no whistles. More. <laughs> exactly. Good stuff. Our interview today with Curtis Gabriel is presented by our pals at CoolBet.co. CoolBet, uh, Chris Abbott will be joining us a bit later on the podcast. You, of course, will have the latest odds news. Uh, we'll talk about March Madness. We'll talk about the Sabres. We'll talk about the Flyers. We'll talk about baseball. All of that. you got to be 19. CoolBet reminds you, stay cool and always bet responsibly. All right, Curtis, welcome to Ray and Dregs, uh, the Ray and Dregs Hockey Podcast. Man, what an interesting week that you've just come through. Um, I guess we could look back at Saturday night and uh, the hit on Johan Larson of the Arizona Coyotes. And then prior to that, uh, you had some I, – I, Ray loves the word shenanigans, and, yes. and I like the word shenanigans. So I, I got to kind of – every once in a while protect myself. I use it too much. But in this case, it applies. Shenanigans is a pretty good word for what went on pregame with uh, Curtis McDermott. Uh, so why don't you just kind of lump it all in and, and start with Saturday night, the hit on Larson, and, and what happened? What were you thinking? And was the major penalty justified in your opinion? Uh, in my opinion, definitely not. Um, you know, I'm not out there to hurt people. I'm out there to to make people not want to play hockey that night. That doesn't mean anything but what it means. I'm trying to I'm trying to say, oh, you know what? We're, let's not maybe win this puck battle when Gabe's is on the ice because he's coming to hit me. Maybe we'll try again next night, and we we have a better chance of getting two points. That's the only thing I'm out there to do. So, I think if you watch that play, if Johan wants to move that puck quicker, I'm skating away from it at the time. But then I realize that he's holding on to that puck, and he's holding on to that puck, and he's looking for a pass, and then he makes the pass, and he's watching his pass. I count two steamboats, and I hit him on the middle of the second steamboat, and uh, right through the shoulder. So, um, I think that's if they want to call it a two minute for interference, I would still be like, okay, but um, that's part of the game to me. And um, I've been, I've been suspended once in my life, obviously with the hit on Patrick and me and George have talked about that. And, and I was remorseful for that. And, and he even admitted, I, I let up on that hit. Uh, I knew it was going to happen before it happened and I'll wear that all day, but um, that's one hit in four years of junior and seven years of pro now, but uh, I'm not a dirty hitter. So with that hit, they, they give you the major for interference. Mm-hmm. Um, do you hear anything from the league or your team in the aftermath of that? Do they get, do you get instruction? I mean, I, I hit six guys in 18 years, three of them by accident, but like, do you get instruction out of that? Yeah. So in, in this case, it was, uh, George giving me a call and just saying, Hey, you know, obviously you're, you're putting a target on your forehead. And I think I said that on a podcast, I'm okay with that. And I, I know that's what the way it is and that they're going to watch everything I do. And uh, he just said, you know, just be careful. That's uh, it's borderline late. I, I I was able to talk about it, you know, cause it was through the shoulder and I think he's, I think he's right about that. And so, yeah, it's um, that's my game. It's like, what, what do you, <laughs> it's hard to pick and choose when to finish a check, right? Like um, obviously I can look at myself and say, maybe there's nine minutes left in the game. Do I need to, do that but it's hard when that's my my game and my mentality all the time but uh, I don't know it's it's uh, every case is different but yeah a little instruction and a little bit of uh maybe I'm just I'm just gonna learn and get better as I go here I'll, I'll get better at it so Curtis a couple of weeks ago Brandon Tanev got a five in a game um you know we we talked quite extensively about the hit and in the aftermath of that Sidney Crosby said it and and I mean when when somebody like that says it carries great weight, he said, it would be nice to know what's a legal hit and what's not. Is that a relatively common thought? Do you think? 
For me, for me, I think it's not. I'm, I'm quick to judge things. I see it and I'm like, yep, yes or no, because I know I play this role and, and I've okay. done this for so long. But I, I think I think a lot of guys don't know. I think I think you're right by him saying that. I think that is indicative of what a lot of guys think because you saw the divide after that hit. In no way, shape, or form was that hit dirty in any in any mm-hmm. planet, any universe. Um, so I think there needs to be some more um, maybe clarification and uh, but. <laughs> That's part of the game. That's that's the hockey. You have to know who's on the ice. You have to know where you are. I think Shane O'Brien was talking on the Miss and Curfew podcast. You know, Tenorti chose to take an extra step to get across that red line. That's that's his decision. That's him putting his body on the line for his team. And that's what players do every single shift, every single night, what makes our game special. So, and you're going to pay the price for that. I talk about it all the time. I'm... I play this role. I have to pay the price for it. Tenorti wants to go over the line. He already laid out Malkin with a clean hit early in the game. He's got to know that Tanev's going to try to get him if he can. When you say play this role, it's not an easy role. There's uh, and there's less less of the big boys around than there than there used to be. So you your role takes you into the wake of Ryan Reeves and Curtis McDermott, who is a son of an old teammate of mine. I mean, these guys are monsters. <laughs> so how how do you go about you know it's coming. You know it's part of it. Yet it seems to me, anyway, you want to attack it headlong as opposed to waiting for it to come to you. Yeah, well, I think it, it depends on the situation, and that's what I think people always, you know, that don't necessarily understand hockey don't realize. You guys obviously do. So, you know, with all the stuff uh, I've, you know, talking with guys in warmups, there are reasons for that. If there's no reason to talk to a guy in warm up or stir it up, there's not. And you watch me play Anaheim. There's no. There's nothing with Nick Delorier. It's a Hey, how are you? I hit your teammate. He asked me to fight. I answer the bell. We fight cut and dry. No extra shenanigans and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, that's, I have to attack it. That's, I just live by my own, you know, code of it that I, uh, I have to answer the bell. If I'm willing to play that way every night and I want to say no days off and I'm tired of guys that play this role, taking nights off, I'm going to do it every night. Well, I got to be willing to answer the bell every night. So if it's time to answer the bell, there's no hesitation for me. If it, if it suits the situation, if it suits my team, I'm not fighting for myself, but if it's zero, zero, and I've been laying some hits and Durham asked me to fight, I have to answer the bell. It's the way it goes. I, uh, I ran across you the first time you were playing in Iowa with Landon and this first time I'd seen you play. So this is not new. Like your style is your style. It's been that way since I saw you in the, in the American league, I was reading up a little bit. Your path has been incredibly, um, non-traditional. I mean, you were not playing hockey, I'll say for real, when you were 17 years old. So like, how do you go from a basketball player and a baseball player to, hey, you know what, maybe I could become a hockey player full time. Like, how do you do it then? Yeah, it's, it's then because I lost my dad at 10 years old, right? He took his own life when I was 10. And I had just made uh, the Richmond Hill Stars AAA team. And I came from AA. My dad got me all the releases. He knew I liked baseball or sorry, hockey better than baseball and basketball. And he went all in with me on it. And um, I, I, he got all my releases. I couldn't make the Orca Simcoe Express. They're always a powerhouse team, the 93 age group. And I, I get to Richmond Hill and nobody knows who I am. But Barkley Goodrow's there, and he just came from the powerhouse Double Aurora Tigers that won the whole league the year before. And he comes in, and they're like, "He's our guy." But then I came in, and they're like, "All right, well, you're the you were the known Barkley. You're the unknown Gabe's. You're our go to guys this year." And I'm like, at ten years old, my dad's like, "Here we go," you know, it's the classic story. I'm gonna mm-hmm. go all right, just like this. And then when he takes his life, all the confidence is gone. So you know, that really changed everything for me. Hockey just became my game again. It wasn't like, Oh, I'm going to start just climbing the ranks. You know, it was, uh, just go home and play hockey for fun. And my mom didn't know much about it. And she just, that's what she thought we needed to do. And I went back there, you get cut from double a because a coach knows another dad better than you. You go through all the politics without a hockey dad. You just kind of like, whatever, that's just not my path. Um, and then when you get to 16 and you play in major midget, uh, sorry, minor midget, everybody gets drafted to the OHL. I'm playing double a and don't even think about it. I'm like, I'm going to play major midget next year. Try to figure out what I want to do in college. I don't know what I want to do. And my mom just happens to go, Hey, all the other guys are trying out for the new market hurricanes tier two team. It's 50 bucks. Why don't you, you're just as good as them. I was like, okay, mom. And from that day forward, I just went out there and I just rose to the occasion every single time. And it's just, I guess that's just how it happens. I just, they, I went there. I think Brian Perrin was the coach and like, okay, well, we don't know who you are and you played amazing, but you can't play here yet. Go play major midget, triple A and Markham. My mom put me all, you know, she did all the driving and the late marking. She was a teacher and all the tough nights. And that's where they said there, I said, Hey, if you want to play hockey, you got to play more physical. And I said, I'll try it. 
tried it out, liked it, suited me. So, so hope- sorry, Gabe's that wasn't, that wasn't your way initially. No, it's just crazy, man. It's just crazy how it's how it's so weird how it's happened. It's, it's weird sitting here talking about it because it's just, I didn't even know what the OHL was. And here I am going back to the new market hurricanes. I make the team this year after putting in a first summer of working out, they're like, all right, you're back on our team now. And then I'm, I go to a junior C skate, which is the junior A's affiliate team. And they're like, Hey, just go skate and have fun. It's free ice. I'm like, okay, I could have gone there and dogged it and joked around. I went there and scored three goals, put people through the wall, fought another guy named Curtis who played double A Georgina, who he used to play against broke his nose. And that's just for fun. And, and Brian Denny's, Brian Denny sitting there, who's a scout for the Owen Sound Attack, who's not even there scouting. He's watching Joel Hanley play, who's his friend's kid. And he, I step off the ice and he goes, who are you? You want to come try out for the Owen Sound Attack? And I go, no, I, I can't play there. And my mom put, pulls up in the van. I jump in the car. It's my first time driving. The, the ride program pulls me over and the off the firefighter goes, hey, uh, how are your night, how's your night going? I said, we just got invited to try out in the OHL. What a joke. We kept driving home. The next day he calls my mom no, I'm serious. You need to come. He came to a private lesson I was doing. And then boom, I'm, I'm trying out for the Owen Sound attack. My junior team told me not to go there. Like, you're going to make it. I said, I'm not going to make it. I go up there and make the team. I don't even know what happened. It's crazy. (laughs) So, okay. But it's, but it still doesn't get easier because now you play junior, you go through your draft year undrafted. Oh yeah. Right. So you go through and that's seven rounds, 200 players. And no, I, I, I went there. The team was the one that went to the Memorial cup. I didn't play a game from January to June. I practiced two extra hours with Mark Reed's all the time. The late Mark Reed's best oh, coach I've ever guy. had. Unbel- oh my God. I could go on him for about day for days. You drive me home after practice, after staying on the ice, there's this much snow on the ice, just working with me, working with me. And I came back the next year. He moves on to Ottawa. I get this new coach who doesn't know me. I went to the Phoenix Coyotes uh, training camp, made two cuts after not even playing in the OHL, free agent invite. I come back thinking, oh, I'm the man. I'm going to play second line. I'm going to get all this ice time. Garbage year. Terrible. Didn't do anything. Told told next year at, tra- at the exit meeting, they said, Gabes, you're not even a shoe in to make our team next year. So you better come back ready. I went home. I doubled down. I said, mom, I got to go train with Gary Roberts. Went and trained with Gary Roberts with McDavid and all those guys got up to 215, which is what I play at now. And I went back. I was in like the fifth line in practice in the preseason. I went to the coach. I said, I need a chance. I just need one chance. I got put out a line with Kyle Holt and Holden Cook. And we just dominated the rest of that year. We played, we played the top two lines every night. I had 28 points, which isn't crazy, but I was just making life miserable for Trocheck and Wilson and Nazan and all these guys. And I get to the, uh, I get to the uh, uh, Christmas party and my mom's me and my mom are sitting there drinking like an orange juice. And Dale DeGray comes up to me and he looks at both of us and he goes, your son's going to get drafted in the NHL. And my mom almost like threw a drink and I'm like, what's going on? It's my third year in the, Oh, how am I even eligible for the draft? And then okay, it's just like, then I, then I'm going to the draft and, and my agent goes, yeah, well, you, you're going to get drafted. I said, we're going to the draft. He said, yeah. He's like, I'm flying you down there. I'm like, okay. He's like, you're going in the fifth round. If somebody likes you, you go in the third, boom, Minnesota third round. Walking down the steps, mom bawling her eyes out. I have no idea what's going on. It still doesn't even feel like I got drafted. It's crazy. <laughs> when you play, do you – the sacrifices your mom obviously had to make mm. once once your dad passed away. Like, I, I can't even really imagine, but it th- does that – is that a driver? Does oh, that, my gosh. Is that something you – aspire to oh yeah like unfortunately for a while with mental health stigma the way it was i thought my dad just left and he didn't love me but as we know he was sick he was mentally ill taking his own life so i i I use that as motivation for a while as like i'm going to show you the man i'm going to be but once i figured that out and i can look back and hindsight's 2020 my mom is the emotional driver for sure she's like uh she's gone from at 10 when i was 10 she didn't know anything about hockey now she's like a hockey scout she'll like go to games just for fun she's like hey i noticed this system i noticed this i noticed this she's like you got to do this and i'm like mom who are you like you know the game better than all these idiots that comment on my instagram posts so it's like um she's she's unbelievable and she doesn't take enough credit um she's such a humble natured person and i'm I, you know i'm trying to do this mother's day thing for her this uh, with tsn we're supposed to do this special on her and she's like i don't want to talk on tv and all this i'm like mom you need to take some recognition you're the best freaking mom out there and i would not be here without without you she's I, she's who i call after i do every single thing obviously my girlfriend but she's been there since day one and i'm i'm in the nhl but she's in the nhl well we were gonna talk about that i mean 
as we're prepping, I'm thinking to myself, you know, I mean, look, you could be the strongest voice in the National Hockey League when it comes to the battle against uh, or for a diversity, for inclusion, against homophobia, you name it. You know, any social injustice and, and you want your name and your voice in the battle against it. So does that explain where that comes from? You know, the recognition that your dad had an illness, took his life, the support of your mom and, and everything that goes in with that. Yeah, like I, my mom's let me be exactly who I need to be my whole life, my authentic self from day one. And I make a mistake. She's right there to help me and pick me up. And then when I saw a friend of mine, uh, their friend went through, you know, basically being unsupported financially by her family because she came out to be in a relationship with another woman. And she's the sweetest human in the world. It's my first exposure to this. And I'm like, this just doesn't add up. Like my mom, she wouldn't care what I did. As long as I'm not hurting anybody else, not breaking the law, she'll love me to death. So I was like, that just doesn't ma make sense. And um, I was raised and my mom's so aware of this now. She's taken on this process with me as well. She raised me amazingly, like love everyone, but with no, we're naive to the issues. You know, she's from immigrant Scottish parents. We weren't conditioned to talk about this. And that's what's white fragility. It's straight fragility. It's all these things that all of us take for granted that these other people have to deal with. And we all woke up to that in my family. And um, now I'm just trying to make up for lost time. And I want to be on the right side of history. And I'm in a secure enough place now to talk about it. When I first turned pro, was I ready? No, I had no idea. And I'm not asking everybody to jump on now, but you need to do the work and, and find a time when you're ready to jump in on these issues and change, make positive change for the right reasons. Like this is a lot of crap going on. This, I just saw a tweet set, sent to me, some transgender man who serves in the military was out for a date with his girlfriend. They're having beers with this uh, bunch of people and uh, having a great time. Oh, thanks for your service. And then it happens to come up that the man's transgender. They walk out of the bar. The guy comes up and just breaks his back, fractures his skull almost kills him just because of who he is. And right before that, he was yucking it up, having beers with him. So this is this is what needs to happen is the humanization of these issues needs to happen because we are supposed to be the best people in hockey, but hockey culture lags behind all the other ones. So let's step up and be good people, have this issue humanized, and then actually do something about it for once. When, when you talk about this, clearly your passion yeah, you for can, yeah. being um, at, at, as a leader in it, um, in, in this awareness, but when, when I hear this and I hear, you know, what is the NHL doing about it? Does the, does it start there? Does it start at the grassroots? I've, I've never quite understood. I mean, the responsibility is clear for the NHL because you're a leader and that's who people see, who people attach the most voice to. But does the, when we talk about Hulk hockey culture, doesn't that have to start young? Does it before we can expect it to be better on a grander basis? Absolutely, but just like in everything, there's a there's a balance to it. It can't be one or the other. It's the it's a, a little bit of both. So mm. the leaders need to do their part. So this is where I take issue, and me and Brock McGillis. I mean, I'll, I'll say this right now, and I, this is public knowledge. He's he's gone to the NHL. And he said, I will talk to every team for free and humanize my story of drinking myself to death in Sault Ste. Marie because I heard homophobic language in the locker room. Driving around every night, wanting to die at 4 a.m. in the Sioux, drunk driving. That's not who he is, but that's who he got made into because he wasn't accepted for who he was. He was on draft lists. He was supposed to get drafted. He had a season-ending injury six years in a row because he was drinking himself and not sleeping, drinking himself to death. He was willing to go talk to every team about that. They said no. Why? Why? is the NHL expert on homophobia on, on all these issues? No, they're not. So I'm sorry, but let's get secure with ourselves. We can, we can take criticism. We can, we can make change. I get criticized all the time. I learn, I try to change my game, whatever I, I, I learn. I, you take something, you learn from it. So maybe they should outsource their knowledge to people who understand this and the academics. There are people that study homophobia in hockey every day. Like there are people that do this. Maybe bring those people in and let them run the show. It's okay to turn the keys over to people that know more things than you. That's what needs to happen. So that's where it needs to start. But in the meantime, I'm just trying to show that, hey, an NHL player, white guy, all the privilege in the world can say, this is not okay. And this is cool to stand up for these things. So that's what I'm trying to do. And then that's where we need to shift it to the grassroots, where if we're doing it up top, it'll filter down to the bottom and then kids need to grow up with it. And it's already happening. You're seeing kids out in East, out East. Mm -hmm. There's a kid, uh, there's a, sorry, quick story. There's a, uh, a, a policy of dress code and a, a boy wanted to wear a skirt to school and he got suspended for it. 
so they the kids made their own idea to sh- all the guys show up in in skirts just to support the guy hmm. right right and instead of 100 like 300 kids showed up in skirts like that's where it's going to happen the change is going to happen with the kids nobody is born hating anyone we are all conditioned we're all conditioned to hate and it can be unlearned. It just takes effort. It takes getting uncomfortable. Just how you said, how did I get up to where I am right now? I got uncomfortable to get my, to my goals of playing hockey in the NHL. You need to get uncomfortable for not just yourself, for the greater good of everyone. We're all humans. We're in this together. It's just mind boggling that we are dealing with this in 2021. Yeah. What, uh, Curtis, what's the liberation line? I was watching on, uh, yeah, I was, there we go. Twitter, uh, and look, this, you didn't ask for us to talk about the liberation line, but we are going to talk about it because uh, it's important to you and you're raising money. So uh, here's the opportunity to explain what it yeah. is and what it means to you. Thank you. Great segue. Plug it out. Uh, so Conquest Hockey is a company out of uh, London, Ontario, where I train. I made good friends with their owner, James Purcell. He's always preaching the right things. Um, he's a great man. So we collaborated on some gear where it's, uh, you know, Conquest Hockey and Conquer Homophobia. And uh, it challenges, you know, it challenges you on the back. It has a big message about, uh, you know, people in the world still face death from being themselves of being out like there's countries and that's a real thing. Uh, so it challenges you to change that queer people are just normal people, period. It has all that on it has a cool logo. So it's at Conquest Hockey and uh, it's a collaboration that we're doing to just raise awareness and break down the stigma in hockey because we still are the only major professional sport that hasn't had a gay player come out. And it's just it's just time like it, we have to change these things. There's there's 100 percent gay hockey players in the NHL. Let me repeat. There is 100 percent gay hockey players in the NHL. End of story. So they're clearly doing fine. Maybe they do be doing even better if they were being accepted for who they are. So we need to make it more inclusive for that to happen. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's an awesome uh, thing. And, and Conquest, Conquest Hockey has been amazing. And I'm hoping to take my proceeds of it and do a, a, a help uh, somebody in a trans community get a top surgery as part of their transition. Curtis, do you, th- do you think the NHL is ready for a player? Not right now to come out. You don't, eh? I I used to say that. And that's my own naivety. I'll admit that. I used to say it on other podcasts, but the more I've gotten to know Brock and the more I understand this issue, not right now. Um, Would, would that player feel on an Island? Would they feel um, under an incredible microscope? Would, or is it both and all of that? I mean, everything, everything under the sun. Um, I like to think because I see the good in people and I, I'm sometimes I'm naive about that too, is that we would figure it out on the fly. I really think we would, but it's not at the place for someone to feel comfortable enough to do that. And that's sad. And um, do you yeah. not think what, do you not think today guys don't care? Like who I, cares? The, you wouldn't believe it, Ray. You would not believe it. Um, I mean, I'm the, old and I know. I'm, you know, I'm 57. And so when I played, it was a different world. I, yeah. I look at today and I'm like, Everybody has somebody they know that is gay yes. or yes. or lives a different lifestyle. Yes. And, and why would you care? Exactly. I don't get I I I I don't know. I I I guess my naivety is that I think or I have thought that the league would go, wow, that's unbelievable. This player has the courage to say that I'm I'm a gay man playing in the NHL, okay. and everybody would go, Yeah, good for you. Yeah. Because that's happened to broadcasters we know. They've come out and said, uh, I, I'm a gay man. And, mm-hmm. and the support I, is over, well, the public support is overwhelmingly mm-hmm. positive. And I, mm-hmm. so you think that wouldn't be the case? Not in the locker room right now, but the way hockey culture is. It's, it's only for the team, nothing about yourself. Like it's just, it's, it has to change. Like I'm trying to change that just like, as we were talking about before this podcast a little bit, like just being myself on social media and stuff, even that's mm-hmm. frowned upon. Like how, if that's being frowned upon and, and John being judged about that, how do you think it's going to be how someone wants to be in a relationship with a man and in, in public? So I, it's just, it's not, it's not there. I have, you would, you wouldn't believe the guys I've played with and stuff. And you think they're just, you know, everybody, you can be a good person and be naive and ignorant to these things. And they're just like, you, you, that, that has come up and they're just like, there's no way I would shower with a gay guy. There's just no way. Like he's, he's looking at my, he's looking at my genitals. I'm like, how, how insecure do you have to be to think that he's sitting there? Oh yeah. He's in the shower, like thinking about me and you know, like, come on, man, we're brothers. We're a team. Yeah. It's, it's, so that's the, one of the big hangups is like, I think what would happen if we get to the right places, you could have two showers at first 
And then once everybody realizes it's no problem to shower with the guy, then everybody would just be like, what are you doing in the other one? Get back over here. Let's go. Let's go talk about, it. let's take him out and see what guys he's interested in. Like that's, that's, I, that's how it needs to happen. But guys are just too insecure at this point. And um, it's not, it's not an open enough topic for maybe the gay guys in the league that just see the performative pride night, put pride tape on her stick and forget about it. Maybe that's not enough for them. They need, maybe they need more. Now. Okay. So I'm going to, th- this has got nothing to do with what we're just talking about. Okay. But I read something about you that, that I can't about your, the way you eat. Oh yeah. Here we go. Well, because it's ridiculous. It's not. If you, I'll explain it. I'll explain eat it right a now. damn, I like potatoes. Drags is a <laughs> farmer. He likes potatoes. But okay. okay. The, this Go is ahead. how, like, Ray, this is how I was introduced to Curtis's uh, <laughs> social medias. My son, Mason, 19 years old, he's like, dad, you got to follow Curtis Gabriel. He goes, guy eats like 72 baked potatoes a week. Hashtag goes, potato power. Yeah, no, it's um, it's so in this this summer I started working with a UFC nutritionist and um, I was having problems with my gut health and uh, we all yeah. have different ins- sensitivities. So gluten, uh, sorry, wheat, uh, dairy, and eggs were just not working for me, and I cut those out and I felt unbelievable. Was it shitty at the first part? Yeah, yeah. eating eating 100 rye bread that was like cardboard. Yeah, it wasn't fun, yeah. but at least I could find it in the summer and and um, you know Canada was much more safe with the pro protocols and everything and. You know, at the point where I'm at now, I can't afford anything to derail me. I want to stay in the NHL so bad. So I will not visit a store. I am terrified of this thing. I'm not going there. If I get a false positive in California, I'm out for 10 days. So I'm just like on high alert. So uh, on Instacart, which is how we get our groceries delivered, I can't find the bread I'm looking for. It's, I could only find it at one store back home in London that I'd have to go and just deplete it every week. So I've just, the next possible thing was to just, it's as easy and convenient to just microwave a potato and just eat it like an apple and just <laughs> my shake with it. And it's just, I, I, but I will say this. I had a, I had a girl from my high school who I was friends with. She's been seeing all this potato stuff and I've been defending it saying, I've been doing this forever. And she said, I still remember you bringing green pepper to school and eat it like an apple in front of everybody. And everybody would just die laughing. We'd go on basketball road trips and I'd go grab an iceberg lettuce before even paying for it. Just walk around and eat it just to fire the boys up. Like I just, I like doing things just to fire people up, but it's also just convenience. So it's, it makes total sense to me. And uh, my good friend, Brock McGillis, an activist, who's the first openly male, gay professional hockey player that played in North America. He's just kind of going at me about it all the time. We made it into this like Instagram, Twitter feud. It's just a lot of fun. So, so Yuri, you just said like, I grabbed my shake and a potato. Like, yeah, so I, I microwave it. Then I make, I microwave a huge potato the night before I got a video coming out. It's going to be hilarious. Uh, and I, I put it in the fridge so it's not too hot. I wake up, put it in the microwave for a minute and I sit there and chomp it down and wash it down with my shake. And I feel unbelievable. I, I mean, you see me playing every night. I got legs. I, I'm no dairy, no wheat, no eggs. Feeling unbelievable, just flying around the ice. So let's keep her going. Like no so salt, no pepper, no it's sour. Just, it's cream. just inconvenient. Just it, I can't eat dairy, right? So I can't have yeah. butter. I can't put the sour cream on. I can't salt and pepper, maybe. But like, what's the point at that point? Just shove it down my mouth. It's like eating chalk. <laughs> so, so man, if if you're inviting, you know, not now because you can't do anything. But if you're inviting, like some buddies over for dinner. Tell me that's not what's on the plate. Like seven baked potatoes and everybody gets a protein. Hey, if, if people are coming over, I would be willing to say, I'm going to set aside the time and I'll put, you know, the tin foil, I'll put some olive oil, I'll put some salt and pepper. I'll put it in the oven. I'll roast it for an hour. I will do that for others. But when it comes to me, I'm about performance, convenience. Let's go. I don't care what, if it tastes good, I just need to get it down my throat. I am six four two fifteen. If I don't eat four meals of a thousand to 1500 calories a day, I'm just going to lose weight. I'm just that type of body type. So I am just constantly mowing food. I have no choice. So I just, I get sick of eating. I get so sick of eating and I just want the easiest way possible. So is there actual nutrients in a potato or is Absolutely. the potato fills you up and it's the shake where you're getting well, it? I'm endlessly, I'm never full, but like I can eat, like I ate a hundred chicken wings at one point in Iowa. The boys okay. challenged me. Zach Phillips asked me if I could eat a hundred chicken wings. I said, yes, <laughs> Buffalo wild wings. Let's go. I ate a hundred Buffalo or barbecue chicken wings in one sitting. It took me an hour and 30 minutes. So oh, I can wow. eat. I'm not, I'm you not had kidding. to be in a full sweat. I was full, oh, full sweat, the same flavor. I don't think I can ever eat that flavor again. <laughs> and the boys are like, you guys are going to, the boys are like, you're going to feel terrible after the, after in practice tomorrow. And I was buzzing. I felt great, but no, um, what was the question? If I ever get full, what was the question? I'm yeah, right. no, I just said you eat the potato oh, just to get full. Nutrients. And nutrients yeah, because it's not, it's not wheat. It's not dairy. It's not eggs. It's carbs. <laughs> it's paleo. 
it's uh, clean cows, clean, clean carbs. Yep. That's bad. I, I don't even know where to go from that. No, I, 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 <laughs> there's not I don't think there's go. anywhere to go, Ray. I, I don't think there's anywhere. We I'm, can I'm looking at what we got out for dinner tonight and it's, it's, uh, you know, it's not really fancy or anything. It's like a taco night, but it's more than a potato. It's more than a potato. I know. I know. But the, the I, you know, vers- that you, you know, we're not ever going to watch you play and not think of a potato. Good. I, I got a potato deal on the way. I think so. You'll see that becoming <laughs> soon. I'm already, I'm already turning, I'm already turning into cash and it's a perfect partnership. I think it'll be coming in soon. So it's uh, what's wrong with that. I'll put a potato on my helmet. I think Brock was joking with me. He wanted me to like, you know, back when the shenanigans were going on, he wanted me to, you know, stare across the, the red line and just pull out a baked potato in my pants and just eat one as I stare at somebody. <laughs> Just to, so good. just to scare the living daylights out of them. But uh, I know it's probably the end of it, but I really appreciate the time. And I just want to wrap up and saying again, like, you know, it's unbelievable. Uh, you guys have me on and give me this platform, but I, my criticism of the NHL is it's not, I'm calling it in. I, I want, I want to help. So just call mm-hmm. Brock, call, call myself. If you want to call the ally, but I'm trying to amplify these voices to help make change. I'm not in here to piss people off, but sometimes you have to ruffle feathers to make change. It's just mm-hmm. history. So I'm here to do the right thing. I'm not have any bad intentions. Um, yeah, that's it. Well said, man. Well said. We appreciate you taking the time, Curtis. No problem. Thank you so much. I, I looked up to you guys for a long time, watch you guys for a long time. So a big honor. My mom was pretty pumped to hear I was coming on here. So thank you. <laughs> well, we're tell your mom, we want to see her talk on this interview. Yes. She, she has to, to do it. She needs and, to. Uh, congratulations on your hard work, pulling yourself from a place that nobody would have ever given you a chance to become an advocate for so many others. Uh, keep doing what you're doing. Thanks for thank your time. Hey, eh, Curtis. Thank you so much, Ray. Thanks, Drex. Thanks so much. Ray, what a fabulous discussion with Curtis Gabriel, uh, 27-year-old young man. We can call him that because we're much older. Um, and we know that he plays a tough style of hockey. He really has since, you know, he he turned pro. Uh, and he has gone down a difficult path, to say the very least, dating back to the early days. You know, he lost his father to suicide, which he openly talks about here on the podcast. But, you know, what impressed me most was the passion how articulate he is and how committed he is to being an advocate for all of these initiatives that he just puts it out there, right? You know, he'll have the conversation with us on a podcast, but his Instagram posts are, are both heartwarming, they're inspiring, and then they can be crazy funny as he makes his way through his potato factory and all of those things. So you get a little bit of everything with Curtis Gabriel. Well, I, that's a really good way of, of describing it, Dregs. And I, I think that I hope the thing people hear when they listen to Curtis is they hear his message. He said something. I'm not calling the NHL out. I'm calling the NHL in. Right. And I thought, man, that's such a great way to put it. Because as we know, and we saw through the last few years and things, everything is you say something, I have to argue with you. I can't even see the good in your argument. I don't know where there's an argument to what Curtis is talking about. It's talking about people with and advocating for people to respect them, to respect their views, to respect the way that they live their life. I don't understand how anybody can debate this. Now, you might hate the way Curtis Gabriel plays the game, and you might hate some of the shenanigans that Curtis engages in, but we both have known people on the ice that are absolute menaces. Mm -hmm. And then you meet them and they are the nicest people that you run into. I can, I can go through 10 guys like that, just like that, that I would be able to, to put in that category. I, I hear, and we hear the, the people talk about advocacy and, oh yeah, why do you have to use your platform? Stay in your lane. If you stay in your lane, nothing changes. How can we look at today and go, everything's fine? It's not. We've made, I think, really large advances, but we're nowhere near advanced enough. Well, you brought it into the dressing room and, you know, again, it, it was an educational conversation with Curtis. Um, I think I was equally surprised and disappointed that he just flat out said the dressing room isn't ready yet. 
it isn't ready for a gay man to come out and say, look, I'm not different. I'm just gay. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 that, that surprised me to be fair because, you know, you've got adult children. I've got adult children. They don't think that way. They don't think that way anymore. Don't care. Thank God they don't care. Yeah. Yeah. So I was, I was surprised and, and disappointed. Um, but also, you know, had to take a breath when, when Curtis just bluntly said, it's not, we're not ready yet. We're not ready. And that's, that's disappointing. And so, and so when I asked him that, I thought, or I assumed the answer was going to be, yeah, I think so. We will support yeah. him. He will be supported because we have seen some journalists uh, talk about um, their personal life and been really overwhelmingly supported. Mm -hmm. But the fact that they had to feel so nervous and scared as to go ahead and make that step, I guess, should probably be indicative to all of us that we're not as ready as we think we are as a, as a society. And we're talking about the NHL. We're talking about that with Curtis and it doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what you think, Dregs. He's sitting in the room. Yeah. All right. Time for throat punch. Um, I'm going to start this week. Let's, I think you should. Yeah, let's shake it up here in episode 16. Um, feel bad for Aaron Eckblad. We talked about that in the headlines earlier in the podcast, you know, just a devastating injury for both the player and for the organization. Uh, I don't understand the need for secrecy when, when you have something this significant and, and you and I have talked about it on the podcast before, and I live this in my professional life where I do respect uh, the privacy of individual players uh, and certainly their personal lives. And that's why I don't chase COVID-19 stories. If a player's COVID protocol, I'm not making calls to find out, ooh, you know, did he test positive or was it contact tracing, any of that. That's personal business. I, I don't get into that. We could all see how Aaron Eckblad injured his leg, right? So the throat punch goes to the Florida Panthers for, for just trying to pull one over on everyone in their release, saying that he'll be out a minimum of 12 weeks, they say that Aaron Eckblad will have surgery to his lower extremities. There's a lot of extremities that can be lower, right? I mean, yes. is it his big toe on his right foot? No. Is, I don't think it was. No, I don't, I don't think, think it so. was. I mean, did he tear a muscle in his right buck cheek? I don't think so. No. Looked to me like it was his left leg. Correct? Is that what you saw? That's, that would be it. So without getting into detail, you don't have to tell me that it's his knee. You don't have to tell me it was a spiral fracture. You don't have any of that. Just say it's having surgery to repair a fracture of his left leg. Boom. Yeah. We're done. Fracture of the, or, or surgery on his lower extremities? <laughs> like, come on. So just, and I'm not going to dig on this because whatever, out of respect for Aaron, I wouldn't do that. But Normally, so I'm 50, almost 53. In my 40s, that would have pissed me off enough that I would have made 50 phone calls to find out the exact detail of damage to that guy's leg. I'd have found it out. I'm not going to do it this time, but the Florida Panthers, whoever wrote that press release and was so vague, gets the throat punch this week. My throat punch is, um, I don't think I often throat punch an individual player. Hmm. Uh, maybe I do. I forget. Anyway, uh, it's going to be Matthew Kachuk from the Flames. I like Kachuk. I like him a lot. I played with his dad. His dad was hilarious. There's a lot of the Kachuk boys that you could see what the way Keith played. Mm -hmm. Last night, so this is Tuesday. Yeah, so Monday on night. Monday night, they're playing Winnipeg. And he's back checking up the ice against Mark Shifley. Right. In a 1-1 game in the first period. And nothing is going well for the Flames this year. I mean, yeah. it's been it's been a slog. So, no, I, I think Matthew is near the league lead in drawn penalties. So, he's back checking on Shifley. 
right in the middle of the ice, it looks like he's shot from the upper deck. <laughs> he goes down. He's trying to draw the penalty. There is no penalty. Now it's a two-on-one. Connor to Shifley, it's in the back of the net. And so while he's doing snow angels at the blue line, Mark Shifley's scoring. Don't make it harder on yourself. Right. It's already hard enough. Right. You guys, nothing is going well for you. Nothing is going smoothly. Don't put more speed bumps in front of you. Calgary, punch. Nah, it's a terrific throw punch. And I actually gave it some thought as well. So I'm glad you took it. Um, Calgary is almost much must watch now um, because of Daryl Sutter, among other things. Right. Um, and, you know, we didn't talk about this in the headlines, but you had Daryl Sutter <laughs> giving it to uh, Johnny Goudreau. Yep. You know, the question was asked about his 500th game and he, you know, gruffly says, well, I hope he has more energy than his 499th game. Today. <laughs> um, and then, in the game that you throat punch Matthew Kachuk, I mean, it was a scary hit, uh, Dubois on Tanif. And, and it was just the way that the collision aligned that Tanif kind of went into the board's head, neck first. It looked brutal, and, and thankfully he was okay. But then they cut away to Daryl on the bench. Did you see that? So what, Was he eye poking himself? Yeah, what? he's still in this. <laughs> but so was he himself. poking his eyes saying, open your eyes? I, I guess so. Yeah, okay. Or, you know, I don't know, like use your eyes or are you blind? Like, I don't know what he was trying to do, but with the mask and everything else, just the, 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 the crusty old rancher man with the finger poke, just, I literally belly laughed on the couch watching this last night. Well, of the great surprises for me this year, the fact that on Wednesday, Calgary and Vancouver are going to be playing to see who, who gets fifth place is bizarre to me. It is. It's crazy. Time for a weekly visit with Chris Abbott from CoolBet.co. Now, Chris, uh, we should just forewarn the podcast viewers and listeners because as we're recording the podcast, uh, you've got, what, a fire alarm testing happening the morning of this recording? I do. I do. And I apologize to everybody out there. Just bad timing. But anyone who lives in a condo building knows the... Uh, the frequency of the monthly and annual tests definitely work out to more than 13 times a year. I don't know who puts the title on those, but it sure happens more than monthly and annually. Um, when uh, when we were living in a condo, um, it seemed the testing was right at baby's nap time, almost like like clockwork. And you're like, today is just a Today's a train wreck. So you got it this morning. You'll be good. You'll be good. You'll be fine. Speaking of speaking of train wrecks, we actually the day after St. Patrick's Day this year, the the one night a year where I I do indulge on a weeknight, um, the the actual fire alarm in this building went off at like four a.m. And boys, I was not a happy camper. Let me tell you. No kidding. All right. Well, <laughs> let's get to. Uh, I, I'm sure it's going to go off at some point yeah. during the segment. So just so people are paying attention, you're safe. Everything's fine. It's just testing yeah. happens. A um, couple of things we want to talk about. I know Ray wants to get to the Toronto Edmonton game in just a moment, but first I put a hundred bucks. Well, me and Puffy, Sean Cameron, a good friend of ours uh, works at TSN, put a hundred dollars down on the Sabres last week to beat the Pittsburgh Penguins. Now, of course it was nonsensical, but we felt like, you know, with the coaching change, then all of a sudden there was uh, a COVID scare. Kevin Adams is on the bench, the general manager. It just went, it made good sense based on the odds that we were going to cash in. It was like two zip Pittsburgh in the first <laughs> 10 minutes of the period. And we were like, well, there goes $100. Kind of the way people felt, I'm sure, last night uh, against the Philadelphia Flyers. Yeah, they were plus 170. And this is a Flyers team that hasn't been able to get out of its own way. Um, and everything was looking absolutely fantastic, even up until about a couple of minutes left. And Buffalo has the chance at the empty net, which is, man, like right up there with the Patrick Stefan, like empty no, net it wasn't misses. that bad. It wasn't <laughs> that bad. <laughs> but the, st the stakes weren't, uh, weren't quite as high. And yes, he wasn't on the goal line, but um, still empty net miss. And I could, yeah. I just had this flashback to sitting in my, in my parents' living room, watching the Oilers tie that game in Dallas. And, and I was like, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Boom. There goes the Buffalo bet. 
um, with the with the tie game and the overtime winner. Luckily, I also bet the over in that game, so uh, that got there. But yeah, I mean, everyone in the gambling world was convinced this is it. Buffalo has done it. You okay. know, it was a great chance to bet on them. Philly's not playing well, and uh, again, yeah, it was. Uh, it, it was uh, we got exactly what we deserved on that game, is what I say. So did uh, did people jump in on the live line as well? Oh man, yeah, it's a good thing you brought that up, Ray. After the second period, the Flyers were fifteen to one. There, there we is. go. <laughs> uh, the guy who's doing the fire alarm test also got the Flyers at fifteen to one. He's just sounding <laughs> the alarms this morning. So happy, yeah. It was um, it was huge. A lot, a lot of people got them at that at like plus thirteen forty. Um, people who just had absolutely no faith that the Sabers would hang on and. And it paid off for them. Yeah, it was uh, live betting. It's definitely more popular in in basketball and football mm-hmm. where there's some bigger point swings. But uh, yeah, it paid off for some NHL uh, gamblers on the on that game as well. So you know, guy guys and ladies are making their bets. They're you know they're looking at odds before the game. Odds change sometimes. There's an event that happens. Toronto and, and Edmonton. Uh, they announce Jack Campbell's not going to play. Michael Hutchinson's going to play, and the line changes. So are people? aware enough to make bets in between the line changes? Yeah, if you can get there quickly. And that's what causes the line to change normally is that once, you know, Michael Hutchinson starting tonight, okay, he hasn't been great. Um, People start betting that Oilers line that was about plus 140 uh, the morning of the game and then very quickly after moved to about plus 120. I mean, the Oilers still closed as an underdog, but your return wasn't wasn't quite as good. And hey, uh, the, the the Leafs looked like they were in pretty good shape for a lot of that game. It was reminiscent of a lot of the games they those two teams have played, especially here in Toronto. And uh, yeah, it was uh, it was it was interesting. But you're you're absolutely right, Ray. Like that's why people pay attention to uh, when the starting goalies are announced. People who bet on the NHL are, are tuned in to multiple different websites that that kind of get this information out first. Everyone's following all the all the beat reporters because they're at the morning skate and they got the inside info. So. That's a lot of what's done. And and there's a big conversation right now, actually, about the uh, NHL's transparency about these mm-hmm. things. So we mm-hmm. know in the NFL, there's, a, you know, a, the injury list and it has to be updated at certain times and and actives and inactives. And and there's plenty of coaches who will make everyone wait and, and you wait and see who leads the team on the ice for warm up. So there is a conversation going on right now um, about the NHL and its adaptation to this this ever present sports betting world and and having that information available uh, at an earlier time. What's your best guess as how that's going to turn out? I, Ray, we know how ornery and stubborn some coaches can be and likewise oh. managers and by extension, the owners of these NHL clubs. Now you dangle the dollars in front of the owner's face and, and perhaps that sways it, but that is going to be a difficult transition for some of these guys. Yeah, ultimately, I, I think it will be simply a money thing. Like, hey, your franchise is going to get X number of dollars. And and if the owner says, well, we need this revenue, hey, coach, you're going to put the starting goalie out six days beforehand. <laughs> uh, that's what's going to happen. But, you know, I think, um, you know, by noon Eastern or, or, you know, if we say six hours before game time or something like that, there's always going to be the caveat for injuries and things like that. But sure. this kind of holding it close to the vest and and playing that old school guessing game, Um, I don't know how much advantage it actually gives the other team. It's going to be one of two guys. And I don't know that you really adjust your, you know, Ray, if you're in the chaos, that is the slot. uh, You're not going to stop and think that, okay, this guy is, uh, is worse on glove hand saves. No, it doesn't happen. Right. It doesn't happen. Like from a playing standpoint, a practical standpoint, it, it really doesn't change much at all. If the, I, I think the, the, the information that matters most is in baseball with a pitcher and in the world series, I know the starting pitcher next week. Yeah. And in hockey, we can't announce the goalie. I think, I, I think that change is coming whether, whether they want it or not, it's rolling down. Yeah. I think so too. And then I think you'll see some coaches get cute. Like they'll start a guy and then a minute in they'll, they'll yank him. You know, I, <laughs> sometimes they'll get overthought for sure. You're like, you'll see some Kevin cash stuff going on out there, but yeah, just tell the guy he's going, let everyone know he's going, let's play the game. But um, yeah, when that gambling money really starts coming in um, as we expand here, I think, I think, yeah, it'll be mandated for sure. Just a matter of when. What's the action like in March madness? Still pretty volatile, I presume. It's been uh, it's been crazy. Yeah, the March Madness uh, 
Sound the March Madness alarm because the underdogs yeah. have been absolutely cleaning up. I saw something. Uh, if you bet on every March Madness underdog, like a hundred dollars, uh, you'd be up like six or seven grand right now, just right. betting them to win uh, as underdogs. And uh, uh, the ones that haven't win have been covering for the most part. So it's been uh, it's been actually really good for the sports books because people who don't really watch college basketball all year uh, are. are you know, skewed towards the favorites for the most part. So it's uh, it's been an exciting time. I know a lot of people are completely wrapped up in it and uh, we're getting down to the wire. And I think, you know, some of those upsets early on of the big name teams may may hurt the like the draw factor of the tournament at this portion. But, um, you know, gamblers still going to gamble. Anything we should be looking for in the next week, Chris? In the next week, well, of course, the Major League Baseball season is about to start, so that's going to uh, that's going to be really exciting. Um, one thing I tell people early in the baseball season is is watch a few games first. You don't know how a guy, a pitcher, a hitter is going to look. You don't know how the bullpens are going to look. Um, people are saying that you know for Jays games in Dunedin, there's going to be a lot of runs scored, so maybe look at at totals plays early on, but. Um, like you said, Ray, baseball is so important. There's so many one versus one statistics that, uh, you know, when you use the, the sites that, that accumulate all that data, you really can. Um, th that's a sport where the analytics can certainly help you when you're betting. And of course, uh, I've been touting it. The World Men's Curling Championships are coming up uh, starting on Friday as well. Yes. So Brendan Botcher's team uh, in Alberta, and uh, we'll have full coverage of that as well. All right. Chris Abbott, coolbit.co. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much, guys. Take care. Thanks, Chris. Ray, you talked a little bit, a little bit about living in a condo. Chris Abbott was a good sport there. You could hear the fire alarms buzzing and ringing. He just plows right on through. I've never lived in a condo. I've lived in apartments. It's the same thing, essentially, right? But never a condo. No, I've, uh, we liked it. We liked it. The, the biggest negative to living in a condo, I would say, yeah. is every time you go do something, you got to get in the elevator. Yeah. And I can't tell you how many times we'd get down to the car in the parking garage and say, yep, forgot something back up in the elevator. And if you've got small kids, got to get the bikes down, got to get the bikes up. It's yeah. That's, that's a little bit of a complication. Yeah. I mean, I, I was just too cheap. I didn't like the condo fees, right? Like I paid for this condo. I've got the mortgage and now you you're telling me I've got to pay another thousand dollars a month on top of all. What kind of, of condo were you living in a thousand a month? Well, I don't know. How much are condo fees? Like, what would be? Uh, well, I don't know. When you were looking at a condo, it would have been years ago. So I, yeah. I don't know, a few hundred dollars. Oh, okay. Well, I guess it's not so bad. And that's for the amenities, right, Ray? You've got the weight room. You've got the pool. You've got all. Yeah, that. which I never used. So, like, you know, I don't know. I I didn't mind it. I didn't like going up and down in the elevator. Move it along, would you? Okay, sorry. Yes, it is time for Ask Ray, Ray and Dregs anything. Uh, you can fire your questions to us on Twitter, Instagram, all of our social channels at Ray and Dregs, or on the website, rayandregs.com. It is presented, Ray, by our friends at Endy.ca. Now, I've been sleeping on my Endy mattress for over a year now. We absolutely love it. Firmness, perfect. I roll over. Holly doesn't get bounced out the other side. She snores. I barely, no, I always hear that, but that's fine. She rolls over. It's, it's, it's not an issue. Um, it's breathable. It is cool. Tiny and Fritz love it. I mean, really, our Endy mattress has been uh, a welcome addition to our family. How about you? How have you enjoyed your Endy? The Endy's good. See, we're, we're comfortable in our bed. And that, of course, just means you can sleep, right? Yeah, right. Cammy gets into position and never moves. <laughs> like, when she goes to bed finished you wow. like me i'm kind of moving around I, this side does this my back hurts my knee hurts my flipping over she never moves so when you talk about how you settle in and it keeps you comfortable that i think is the is the trait we like the best of it when we get to having our dog sleep on the bed he weighs five pounds i don't think right, he's gonna make right. it he's not even gonna dent it no. tiny gets on there what's tiny weigh 130 yeah about 130 yeah, that's uh, you're testing the mattress there. No question. So far, so good. And what you're going to find with little Ollie is they're smart, right? It's no different than Fritz. He's got the entire king size Andy to sleep on, but instead of sleeping on his patch of the Andy, he comes all the way up to the pillows. I barely slept last night because my 14 year old dog 
was snoring like right in my ear. So keep Ollie away from your pillows. They like the pillows, right? Well, I can't believe that would happen in our house because I would get up and leave. I would show him who's boss and I would leave. Yeah, well, I've done that more than once. Fast and free shipping, 100 night risk-free trial and money back guarantee. That's why Andy is the best mattress in Canada. Check them out at andy.ca. All right, right into Ask Gray and Dregs, anything from Arthur. Arthur wants to know if we think that refs should be mic'd up more just to provide more transparency and better policing of the game. Now, we saw a trick the other night, right, in the Leafs game where Wayne Simmons was going over to question, a, I guess it was a non-call. Uh, I can't remember who the referee was. Do you remember who it was? No. I, I want to say it was Eric Furlat. I, I was just going to say, I think it was Furlat. But he covered his mic, right? Yeah. You know, and these guys, uh, that doesn't always work, by the way. People in studio and audio say, you can cover your mic all you want. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't stop it. It may stop it from going into the arena. But the audio yeah. people, and if, if, if there's a key open or the mic is open, it's getting... <laughs> On right. the television. So anyway, uh, more or less live mics for the referees? Uh, less. Um, and the reason so is that um, in, in a way, this reminds me of, remember when Matt Duchesne went 45 feet offside and the officials missed it and then they blew up the offside rule and now nobody understands it? Right. So they, they took yeah. a small problem and used dynamite on it. So – we all know what Tim Peel said, and we all know about the officials' management of the game. Why do you? Why is it more transparency if Wayne Simmons goes over to Eric Furlat, tells him to wake the f up? Yeah. Furlat tells him to beat it. Now they get into an argument, and then they leave. How does that provide transparency? Because it doesn't. All it is is you want to know more about what's going on. Mm -hmm. in a part of the game that doesn't matter. The real issue, if they want more transparency in the game or better police the game, and we've talked about this extensively, is to overhaul the way the standard is applied to the game. That's the way you make the officiating better, not by hearing two guys tell each other to F off. All right. Sean wants to know, should Marc-Andre Fleury be in the heart conversation? Sean feels like goalies are always overlooked for this award. Um. In my mind, to win the MVP as a goalie, you've got to be far and away the best player in the league. Like, it can't even be close. When Dominic Hasek won it, yeah, he was so far the best player in the league. Um, they have their award. They, they have their award for the best goaltender in the league. A player can't win that. Not to say we know how important goalies are. I'd mm -hmm. even argue that's why they have their own award. Right. But if a goalie's going to win the heart... In my mind, they've got to be by far, far and away, the best player in the league. All right. Final question is actually lumped in from a bunch of listeners. So it feels like we're covering several with one, okay. with one question because they're all asking the same. And they want to know, was the Burger King, Los Angeles Kings jersey on Twitter last week, your least favorite that you had to wear? Or do players care much at all what the jersey looks like? Do you talk about the sweaters in the dressing room, any of that stuff? When we walked in and saw the, we called them the Joker version. Yeah. And we're like, look at these things. Like we thought, generally speaking, they were the worst jerseys we'd ever seen. I hated wearing that jersey. I felt like, I felt like it was uh, like a men's league. You know, and somebody came up with a, funny idea for a jersey we played I, I know I've said this somewhere before Vancouver had salmon colored jerseys yeah we played them wearing the Joker version of our king the Burger King jersey I want to say it was the worst attired game in the history of the NHL we were looking at them going you guys look like a bunch of clowns they're like have you guys got mirrors in there you check yourselves out it was terrible. I hated wearing that jersey. I oh, I didn't like it at all. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, there's Ask Ray and Riggs anything. Uh, busy week. Every week is a crazy week now. As we talked about earlier in the pod, I mean, it feels like 
especially the North Division, but we can say this about every division with the changes that it is intensifying. And because of that, we've got a number of big games on TSN. So looking forward to being a part of that. What's your week look like? Uh, I get uh, Toronto Winnipeg on uh, Toronto at Winnipeg on uh, Thursday and then yeah. Toronto at Calgary on Sunday. And as you mentioned early, the, um, the games gain importance, they gain intensity. Um, Winnipeg is good. Really good. This will be a real test for, for Toronto once, you know, they're, they're hopping out on the road here pretty quick. And uh, this week, obviously, and um, Winnipeg's coming back. They just played. Winnipeg just played seven games on the road in 12 days. Yeah. They play every second day until April the 14th and 15th when they get to play back-to-back games. Yeah. Well, Winnipeg, Montreal schedule is going to be just pure insanity. Well, Montreal is 25 and 43 starting today. <laughs> I, physically, I don't know how you do that. I mean... Can you well, imagine? you're going to see guys now. I think Montreal is going to have to use their their taxi squad, their extra players. They're going to they're going to have to move people in and out to try and have some energy to play. Yeah, uh, I'm interested to see how Cole Caulfield is going to do. By the way, we didn't get to the college yeah. signings. We've got episodes coming up where we can dig into that. But uh, he could be a shot in the arm for the Montreal Canadiens at some point. All right, any golf on the agenda in the day? Uh, tomorrow morning, 10 a.m. Really. Is the main club open? Like your home course is open? It is open. Yeah. Um, impossible to get a tee time. Yeah. You can, That's frustrating, so, isn't it? Yeah. So you can only book them for the next week. Yeah. And then you put in your times, uh, you know, your your preferred time. Then you put an, the earliest you can play, the latest you can play, and then the computer generates it out. Wow. And you get what you get. So it is packed. I mean, the, the golf course is, has done great business over the last yeah. year. Tell you what, though, doesn't that, doesn't that just tell us how spoiled we were in past years, right? I mean, you'd pick up the phone, feel like playing golf tomorrow. What's, what's the tee sheet look like? Oh, yeah, I'll take that time. You know, right. Okay, well, well, what about Saturday? Is there time? Like, I, I mean, I'd book ahead because you have to plan ahead, but, man. This year is going to be treacherous in trying to solidify yep. your tea time. So. All right, man. Well, enjoy it. And, I will, uh, and um, we'll, uh, we'll get back at it. you got, uh, you got a busy week as always. Yeah, yeah. Looking forward to it. Huge shout out to our partners who make the podcast possible. That's coolbet.co, the free-to-play sports and casino games website. Our friends at OK Tire, it's going to be OK. OKTire.com. Buy Yamaha. Yamaha. Revs your heart, Ray. Right? Yamaha revs your heart. And welcome back to our pals at ND.ca. It's been a great episode, episode 16. Again, with the intensity of the Canadian division and how things are heating up in the playoff march in the National Hockey League. Look forward to a good one in episode 17 next week. In the meantime, stay safe, be well, everybody.